When did you, for the first time, call yourself a novelist? I don't think it's ever happened. But I don't in, think in I've actually, ever actually called myself <laughs> yeah. a novelist. Yeah. Okay. I'm sure yeah. I haven't. Yeah, yeah, it's never happened. But you must have the you must have had the courage to believe in yourself because in America there's almost mm. most too many novelists. I was lacking a bit of courage. I, I, mm. When I finished mm. Legend of Suicide after working on it for 10 years, there were about six agents I sent it to who told me that it's a good book, it's well written, but no one will ever publish this. There's no chance it can sell. And I just believed all of them. I didn't even send it out to anyone else after that. So for 12 years, it didn't get published. So I really believed them. I had, I had no kind of courage or belief that, yes, I can be a writer and my book can be published. And that, that's why I went to sea, because I, I needed a job at that point. And I realized it wasn't going to work out. Um, and, I, and I also pouted. I mean, I, I didn't have any brave responses to this. I, I, I pouted, and I didn't write for five and a half years. And, mm -hmm. and the world really suffered, you know, for losing <laughs> the, those five and a half years. Uh, yeah, so I, I was a big baby about the whole thing, is the truth. And I, I didn't feel that I was somehow, I can be a novelist. Um, I didn't feel anything of the sort. I felt like, I have no money. Fuck. <laughs> and I, like, what can I do? I don't know. I, I could sail. I could be a captain. Mm -hmm. and, that's, and then I, eventually I started writing because I was going to write a book about how, well, it all worked out in the end. We have this boat. We're in the Caribbean. We're living the good life. And then when I was 70 pages into writing it, we sank and lost everything <laughs> in this brutal storm on our honeymoon. <laughs> and uh, I thought, well, it's going to have a better ending now. <laughs> Maybe I'll get published. <laughs> and sure enough, and it, when they published it, it's titled A Mile Down. But my editor actually wanted to give it an orange cover and call it Mayday Man, <laughs> because several times I'd had to call <laughs> Mayday on the radio. <laughs> I'd lost a rudder off Morocco, and then I sank in the Caribbean. And so there was a real lack of dignity to the, uh, the first actual publication. And, and it wasn't reviewed by any real newspaper or magazine. It was only sailing magazines that reviewed me. Uh -huh. So <laughs> I, I still didn't feel like a writer then. And actually, I felt like a real fake. I, I've never actually admitted this in public, but I was a complete fake job on my first book. Uh, I learned that you could run a book like a business. And so what I did was I leveraged, to use one of those crappy business terms, each thing to get the next thing. So I had this book... I had a $5,000 advance with a small, crappy publisher. It was going to be nothing. But I had friends who were writers who had had better lives than I did. So I, I asked them for blurbs, and they wrote blurbs. So then I had the blurbs. And then I told bookstores, the publisher is sending me on a like three-month tour all across the U.S. And uh, I have these fantastic blurbs. Can I read in your store? And they're like, wow, that sounds very big. We'll do that. And then because I read at those bookstores, <laughs> then I contacted radio stations. I'm doing this big tour. I'm reading at this bookstore in your town. You know, can I talk on the radio? And, and none of them seemed to wonder why the publisher was never involved <laughs> in any of this. And so I just felt like such a fake. I did not feel like a writer at all. And this continued up to getting my first job as a professor based on this book, which at that point was a national bestseller. What this meant, what this, it sold about 200 copies one week in Los Angeles when I had really hit them with lots of events, <laughs> tons of interviews. I clustered it in one week. And then I had done the same thing in Washington, D.C., uh, it hit all the cities around there. I got the, on the Washington Post list. Again, about 100, 200 copies. So what a fake job. So when I, when I went to the university, I've never admitted this, and I don't know why I'm admitting it now. It's probably a very bad idea. <laughs> but, uh, but I was a complete fake. So when I was a professor, and this is only, we're talking six years ago now, when I was 39, when I was first a professor with this book, and enduring for the next three years until three years ago when I finally published my first fiction was the first time I didn't feel like a fake. So that, that three-year span where I just had the, uh, the nonfiction book, I felt like such a fake. If anyone finds out, I'm in trouble. Because <laughs> actually no one's read this book. You know, a few hundred people have read this book. <laughs> and, uh, and they think I'm a national bestseller, and that's why they hired me. You know? <laughs> Your first book was uh, nominated for the Booker Prize. Did you live through the same hardships as David in England? Um, well, my... my, my um <coughs> My book, when, when it was published, um, um, everything changed in the sense of how, how I work and my, the circumstances of my, my financial situation. Uh, before publishing my book, it was, uh, it was a disaster because the book took a long time. It took uh, five years to write for me. Um, 
and uh, it changed everything. It said, uh, you can't really be an architect anymore. Um, and so I stopped being an architect and I, um, I painted houses because it was um, the only thing that I knew how to do that was uh, flexible. I could do it in the evenings. And it was intellectually not exhausting like architecture is. So I could just, I could just daydream. Mm -hmm. The only thing I didn't like about it is how it affected my chest, you know, because it's all the fumes. But, but apart from that, it was fine. And um, I did that for a bit. And then I went and traveled and went to places that were very cheap to live and work. So it changed a lot of my, my, um, the shape of my, my, my life. Um, and then I got myself in such a situation um, that I, basically I said to myself, I would borrow, this was the deal I made with myself, I would borrow as much money as I could borrow until I finished the book. I don't care how much it is, I'm going to borrow as much as I could borrow. <laughs> the only rule is I'm not going to borrow from people, I'm going to borrow from banks. <laughs> so as many credit cards they give me, as many, I'm just going to just borrow, right? And I'm not very good at living frugally, right? So I borrowed, but I, just, I sort of lived well, you know? I went and, and you know, eat out and, and, you know, uh, um, and so, so I got myself in a ridiculous situation where I was, I was in a huge amount of debt and great uh, mm. deal of anxiety where uh -huh. you know, yeah. I couldn't sleep and so on. And, and, um, and I, um, I, I was about to finish the book and I thought, um, suddenly I panicked uh, when I was very close to finishing the book. And I didn't know why. Now I, can, now I sort of get it. I, I think I panicked because uh, this book as oppressive as it was on, on my financial situation, it was a sort of shelter. It was a space that made sense of my life. I woke up in the morning and I just thought about the book. And, uh, and uh, the thought of it being done frightened me. I thought I'll be just sort of kicked out into the wilderness and I have to face the, you know, what I've done. <laughs> you know, the, so I, I, I thought, well, what is a way out of this? Um, and I thought, well, a way out of it is to apply for a creative writing degree. And I've always, I, I have always felt um, ambivalent about creative writing degrees. I, uh, uh, I know they've, many people have profited from them, but I've always felt it's not really for me. It's not. Uh, but I thought it would give me a kind, it, made, it would make sense of my days. I would go there and so on. And, um, and so I applied to, to the University of East Anglia in England, and they offered me a place, uh, and they said, uh, you've got to commit, you know, you've got to send us a check, you've got to, you know. And I said, yes, 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 it's coming, it's coming. So uh, the day I finished the book was a Friday. Monday was when I was supposed to start the creative writing degree. Um, and I didn't go. I couldn't get myself to go. Mm -hmm. But a friend said, Look, if you can't make up your mind, just go. It will help you make up your mind. So I went on Tuesday. And on the train to, to Norwich, which is a, about a two-hour train ride from London, uh, my agent called. And he said, and he was sound very cheerful. And he said, uh, look, I've, you know, I've, uh, I've got some good news for you. You know, there's this publisher that really loves your book, and they want to, they want to publish it. Yeah. Um, and I went completely silent. He said, what's the matter with you? I said, no, 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 nothing. He said, where are you? I said, I want to train. He said, where are you going to? I said, so, uh, I got to tell you. <laughs> and so I, I hung up and suddenly realized they were offering, this publisher was offering exactly the figure that I was indebted. By. So I would be basically in the space of a year able to settle all my debts, right? And it was such a relief, particularly that month that we couldn't pay the rent. You know, we had a very kind landlord, but still, you know, we couldn't pay the rent. So... So I got off the train. I didn't make it to East Anglia. I got off the train, and um, there's a, a stop called Manning Tree. This is 11 o'clock in the morning, yeah? <laughs> Manning Tree, the person that designed it was a genius because they built a pub right on the, <laughs> right on the platform. <laughs> and I went and I got myself a double brandy, and I smoked a cigarette. They took the train back to London. I got on my bicycle. <laughs> Never went to East Anglia. What a great story. Yeah, that was, uh, <laughs> so I, I had problems oh. before, but afterwards, uh, things were, were, were much much. much much better. Okay. Are you in debt now? Do you have a lot of credit cards? Of course cards? I am. <laughs> Perfect. Boy, Perfect. Yeah. Such personal <laughs> questions. There are no limits. No, no, no. no, no. 24, no. Huh? Uh, <laughs> listen, you, you both mentioned that writing is an ongoing process and you don't know where you're going. How then do you know when you're finished? At, at, I mean, you both said when you, I finished my book. Do you reread and say, no, it's not finished at all? I, 
I've had a strange experience where the first book took 10 years, but the next books I've written in five and a half months, and they're published almost exactly the same as I finished them that day. And so it was very clear. Today I finished my book. And then I hang out for about a month, reading it over, making outlines, looking at the structure, and make almost no changes. I added seven or eight paragraphs of background info at my editor's request for Caribou Island, four paragraphs or something for, for Dirt, the next one, to make some connections, and no changes for Goat Mountain, the next novel that comes out a year and a half from now in English. And, and so that was a complete change for me, because before I thought, I'd, I'd mentioned that I thought writing was all revision. My first short story, I took through 17 drafts, changing point of view and tense and characters and what happens and beginning in a different place. What I ended up with was a Frankenstein. So every writer works differently, and some people outline everything, which I would never be able to do. Some people revise everything a bunch. Some people write out of sequence and put it all back together. But for me, it's just from the beginning to the end, every day, uninterrupted, five and a half months, and then it's just published that way. Uh -huh. And this is my fourth book now of doing that. Mm -hmm. And it's the only way I can imagine it working. Once I finish, I feel like the book gains a hard candy shell that can't be cracked. I, I just, I can't imagine adding another paragraph. Mm -hmm. I just can't. And it's not that I think it's perfect, not at all. I, I just think that it is what it is. That it's a living, breathing thing that has all these unconscious connections. That if I go in and snip and make changes, I'm going to cut some of those things that I'm not going to see till two years from now. Patterns I'm not going to see in the work. And... At the very least, what I'm offering to the reader is the pure product. You get to read exactly what I saw. <laughs> and that's really all I can offer, I, with no claims about you know, whether that's going to be with or without flaws. Just, uh, just that it is what it is. And I, I feel like it can't be changed. Uh -huh. and, and you? I'm a very regretful person. I suddenly feel very regretful about my last answer. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to re-answer your, <laughs> your question. <laughs> I like that. A bit of revision right I here on stage. <laughs> <laughs> I live in morbid guilt all my life. <laughs> <laughs> and I'll tell you what I was guilty about. Is, is sort of once I've answered that question, I thought, this is what, what a stupid answer that is. Because <laughs> it's a bit like when you sit with someone and they're, 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 they're in love and, they're, they're, and they start telling you what they had to do to win the heart of their beloved. You, know? you think, you shouldn't actually say that. You, know? you, you, you do these things... For the beloved, you don't do these things to publicize them and say, you know, I've put myself in all this difficult situation. And I got all this debt, and it's kind of, it's kind of meaningless in a sense, you know, because on s the, 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 the real answer to your question is that when you're working on a book, you really do feel separate from it. You feel, you feel like you're, 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 a, you're a servant, and you have to adjust your life in certain ways to... to to be the best you can be for, for what the book needs, you know, in very practical, simple ways. I don't mean this abstractly, you know. Right, I've got that off my chest now. <laughs> uh, the, the other question is about, <laughs> oh, the in, that's a very interesting question, actually. Thank you. The ending, the, uh, all of your questions, Tony, are interesting. But, but that, is, <laughs> that, that, that is interesting in the sense that it's quite, it's a, it's a mysterious thing to describe. How, how do you... How do you pinpoint the exact moment when a book starts and when a book ends? Uh, it, it's very difficult. Um, do, you, do you say a book starts when you've written the first sentence mm -hmm. or when you've had the idea or even before you've had the idea? Because this, this mysterious thing happens when you're working on a novel. Uh, you, you, you work towards this thing that you sort of have an inkling of what it might be like. Uh, and all the while, you think this is just, just out of reach. It's just around the corner. I just quite, can't quite see it. Otherwise, you won't go through the struggle of doing it. You have to, it has to be a challenge. But once you finish it, it seems oddly familiar, like something you somehow knew, that you, you, you knew that one day you're going to, to write this. Uh, or or that, not that you're going to write it, but that it's going to be in your life somehow. Um, in my case, when I, uh, the, the moment I know I finished a book is usually uh, a few pages after I finished the book. You know, I sort of, um, I, I realize, and the way it feels is as if sort of the wind has left the balloon, you know. Mm -hmm. So I think, ah, this is, uh, and sometimes it takes about a year for me to, to realize that. Mm -hmm. um, um, I'm hoping to improve on this, <laughs> on this account. <laughs> I like what you said about the inevitability of books. Like, mm. like 
I've had the experience several times now where I've started writing one book, and then just a few pages in, I just one day start writing a different book, and that's the book that I'll end up writing. But looking back, I was picking the low-hanging fruit, stories that I'd begun 20 years before and, and left. Like the most recent book I finished, Goat Mountain, was the same material as the first short story I ever wrote, like 25 years ago. The novel before that, Dirt, was the second short story I ever wrote. So there was a seven-page remnant somewhere 25 years ago that mm. was waiting all that time. So it was mm. inevitable that I would write that book at some point, mm. but I just didn't know it. So I hadn't had a single idea in my head of what the next thing would be, and I started writing something else, but then that thing didn't have a life. That wasn't something that was inevitable that was sitting there forever. It was dead. And so I just one day started writing the next thing. And, mm. and there is something inevitable about it. I honestly feel that we don't choose our books that we're going to write, and also that we're all, none of us are original. We're essentially derivative. We're, we're made up out of all the works that we've ingested and loved and read over and over, coming out all kind of mashed together with how we grew up and the kind of language of our parents and such. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, that's why when you asked an earlier question about, you know, when, when do you know, when did you know that you were a writer or a novelist? And uh, which also I read between the lines that really what you were asking is, um, at what point did you feel confident enough to give this your attention? Uh, and the curious thing uh, is, and, and I feel very similarly to David uh, to d when, when, he, when, he, when he responded, in the sense that you, it, this stuff doesn't come out of confidence. Uh, in the sense that you don't, you don't think, I, I've never thought, yeah, I'm a novelist. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna, I'm gonna a strange down. idea. I'm going to sit down and show you what a novelist does. No? I, I never thought. I, I, I don't. I feel every time I'm described as a novelist, I, I feel there's got a you know. Well, there's a question mark after that. You know, yeah. <laughs> novelist. <laughs> you know, there's a, um, so in a sense, um, it seems to me to come more out of a, a feeling of, and I, I, this is easy. It's easy for it to come to to come out. Uh, in a kind of romantic sense. I don't mean it in a romantic sense that it's a compulsion, that I'm sort of, that I am, that I'm forced to do this. I, I don't mean it in that sense, but it, but more like a, more like a, um, um, a sort of place that, that you cannot escape, you know. It's not, um, it's not a, it's not a, it's not entirely a choice. It's, it, to some extent it is, but not entirely. Some authors really can't escape the world they've created. I mean, John Updike, Richard Fort, even Hemingway. With I feel with so Nick bad Adams. for them. Yeah, they and for Faulkner too. Yes, it must have been terrible to me. <laughs> but but don't you feel like you, you miss the world you created and you want to go back, perhaps give it another twist or follow your protagonist Nuri or Roy or whatever? I had the first time I had the idea of a sequel was for Dirt, the book that's just come out in English that will be out here in the spring, and. <laughs> The, the characters are not likable, I have to admit, in, in, in the novel Dirt. Uh, and two of them who really don't get along well, I had this delicious idea of them marrying and having a kid and being together in the next novel, <laughs> <laughs> in the sequel. And the boat ship. Sh and uh, and it, it might be potentially even more a train wreck, uh, which, of course, I'm very interested in. Uh, but, yeah, I don't think it'll ever actually happen. I, I, you know, I really do feel that I'm expelled from that world pretty much on the day that I finish the last page. And then I have a couple weeks afterward where I might have a chance of adding a paragraph. But after that, uh, forget it. I, I just reread um, a few pages of Goat Mountain, the one that I finished in January. Uh, I just read it like a week ago. And it seemed to me a very strange thing. I, the sound of it, the voice of it, is different than I had imagined in my head. Mm. What a strange experience. Like, it's mm. become a different book by just sitting for a little while. And so my chance of being able to go back and re-enter into the mind of that time that wrote that book, impossible. Like, there's no way I could add anything mm. to that now. But I'm supposed to consider revision sometimes. <laughs> it's going very strange. It's like trying to revise someone else's book. <laughs> Have you felt the same way? Uh, I mean. Yes, I think which is why I feel this thing that I said earlier on that that I that I uh, uh, um, uh, against my better judgment, uh, uh, I I um, interfere between the 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 reader and the book. That uh -huh. I, I do think on some level that actually what I should be doing is writing a book, putting it on the table, and, and getting out of the room. Uh -huh. I shouldn't be in the room. 
uh, but I keep putting myself in the situation. It's kind of fun to be in the room. Where I, where I, where I, well, I know it's. I mean, it's delightful yeah. to see this beautiful yeah. country and do your lovely museum and meet all these nice people. Yes, I, yeah. but I, I feel um, I feel I'm transgressing, and um, and I'm I'm not at all proud of my motives. My motives aren't actually uh, only to to travel and see the world. Um, my motives are I'm sort of I'm sort of worried about being forgotten. You know. Uh -huh. I'm worried that nobody will read me if I don't turn up to things like this. Uh -huh. you know? So it's uh, so so I come and I turn. No, that's the wrong. Uh, that's the wrong reaction. <laughs> that's, that's a very nice. That's a nice. Honey. <laughs> but you know, that's, well, that's, that's, a, yeah, that's a, you know. So in in in, in a sense, I, I I I which is also why I've always felt uh, that creative writing places are not for me, uh -huh. uh, because I feel that writing should happen away from from the world in a sense. that You have to turn your back a bit to the world to, to write. And then you go back into the world as a writer, but not as a writer. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. another problem is, another problem I have with, with, with this is that I don't actually feel comfortable being a writer. I'm only a writer when I'm writing. Now I don't feel like a writer. Now I feel like I'm pretending to be a writer, uh, you know? That I'm a writer only when I write, okay. when, when I've written a decent sentence, I, thought, I think yes. Okay. And of course, then there's no obligation to call yourself a writer, because uh -huh. nobody's asking you. Uh -huh. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I, I reread uh, your novels last week and, and I've, I, in the evening, and then I, when I fell to sleep, Thank I sort know. of had the, the rhythm of your language within me. How do you what feel nice about that? Uh, when you create your language, isn't it hard to leave behind you once you've finished your, your, your book? I mean, you, mm. that's what you mm. said before. Well, I've, I've been translating Beowulf every day from Old English, and, and the rhythm of that language is paired heavy stresses. So mm. uh, two stresses and then two more heavy stresses. And, and it's a different mind that perceives the world in chunks of content without a lot of grammatical arrangement in there. Mm. And more and more in the last three books, I've been heading toward that. Uh, so I've been using a lot of sentence fragments. I've been cutting out grammatical morphemes as much as possible. Uh, the syntax is a little strange in some places. And what I'm looking for each day as I'm writing is I just want to, want to directly apprehend the thing, you know, mm. usually landscape. I want the, the content piece of this, pieces of it to come to the fore and not to have the, the mind that's arranging it or a voice that's arranging it as much. And so... It's not something I think about consciously when I'm actually writing sentences. I, each day, the actual writing happens in less than an hour in kind of short bursts for my, for my page or two, and I'm not thinking about the shape of any of those sentences. But then as I'm rereading it, I'm, I'm looking at, at that for rhythm, and I always reread 20 or 30 pages before I write so that I'm, I'm hearing that rhythm as I'm getting to the point where the new page is going to come. So the, I've noticed a change. I've noticed that Caribou Island was the first one to really, he, the, one of the characters is a failed Anglo-Saxonist, like me. I wanted to be an Anglo-Saxonist, but I wasn't smart enough. I couldn't be a medievalist either. Like, those people are really smart. Yeah. Not only do they read yeah. Old English and Middle English and, and Latin, but they also know French and Old French and, and you know, Old Dutch. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, it's just crazy. Uh, so I, I couldn't do it. So there's, there's a bit of those sentence rhythms in that book. Um, but then it it goes it changes a bit in Dirt, the next one, and then also in Goat Mountain. So uh, I do feel like there's actually an evolution of voice and style that comes from this mosh of what I studied, and it's continually influenced by what I study. And so I'm very conscious of that, and I make sure that I feed my brain every day with Old English. I'm translating it every day, mm -hmm. and I'm also reading something else that I think might feed that in some way. Mm -hmm. And this is actually my main fear about teaching. I love teaching. I love all the time in the classroom with students. But I've read over a thousand student manuscripts at this point. And at some time you have to point you have to mm. wonder, like, crap in, crap out? <laughs> like, like I do wonder about influences. Like some of my students are wonderful, but not everyone in a twenty-two person class can be wonderful. You know, 15 of them are going to write schlock that I shouldn't read. And and so I, I do feel like that's one thing that you do have to pay attention to as a writer is to constantly feed mm. your brain with what's going to be language that moves in the direction you'd like to move in. Uh -huh. mm. You mentioned yesterday that you don't read that much while writing. Is that correct? I, I don't read much fiction when I'm writing. Okay. I, I, read, I read a lot of poetry. Uh, poetry is... Uh, mm. That's good food. That's good food. Okay. <laughs> Very good food. Uh -huh. okay. Um, yeah. okay. Time is running out. I have one more 
question mm -hmm. and uh, probably a stupid one. Do you think you would have been writers had your fathers not disappeared? Well, I was already writing our hunting and fishing stories every every year and giving them out as presents. And, and uh, I had actually written the, the first story in Legend of a Suicide. I actually wrote the first draft in seventh grade a few months before he killed himself. And it was called One Who Lied, and it was about how I trashed the neighbor's house with all the contents of their refrigerator, like yogurt on the rug, ketchup and mustard on the couch, not just the pickles that are in the fish tank in the story. I really did a good job. And I was a little criminal early on. I had a criminal mind. I think that was my other possible career path. <laughs> I, I walked out of the house after trashing it, and I saw them coming up the drive, like up, to, up the hill, far away. So I turned around. At four years old, I turned around. So when they came up, I'd be walking toward the house instead of away from it. <laughs> I mean, what, what great instincts at four years old. You know, so I actually had a, a version of that story, which includes a lot of the material, some of the pieces of, of the first story in the book. When I was in seventh grade, when I was 13, a few months before my dad killed himself. And, and so it already was disturbing enough without having a suicide, just the parents' divorce, uh, having to shoot two deer when I was 11 and not liking that experience. Like hey, Flannery O'Connor has that famous, famous phrase that if, it, if you've survived childhood, that's enough you know, for what you need as a writer. And, and I, I think it is mm -hmm. enough. Mm -hmm. mm. Yeah. Uh, well, I mean, like David, I also wrote before, um, <coughs> uh, my, uh, before I lost my father. So, I, and so writing was part of... Uh, part of my life, and also my my father uh, encouraged it a great deal, uh, and um, he he valued the things that I wrote, mm. and he had uh, together with my mother a very good library at home, so he we we read aloud to each other a lot, and uh, and um, and so that so that lit you know language the the love of language and words was was shared. Um, mm. Since, since he encouraged it, do you feel like you wrote the first book partly for him? Um, no, I don't feel that. I, um, I, I think, I think I would have probably been a writer if 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 I hadn't lost him. Also, but I think I would have been a different sort of writer. But mm -hmm. that's to say that everything actually uh, yeah. uh, it changes. Um, so I don't, you know, I, no, I don't, I don't think, I, I don't, I don't think I wrote my first book for him. I don't mm -hmm. think, um, I don't think I, but who knows, you know, I, I'm not. Yeah, I don't feel, uh, I don't, yeah, I don't feel I, like I, I know I the answer to any of those questions. I don't either, think like I know, but I, I, I do know that there's something still about that space where I go to to write. There is something that is, um, th th something that, that shelters me there. That I go there to 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 work, and uh, and so my I do think of my work as as um, as sort of as sort of my country in a sense, you know. Uh, this it's the you know that's uh, so so yeah that's yeah. impossible yeah. to answer really these questions. I think it's yeah. better to dance. We should all go dance. Yes. <laughs> 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 We're going so dancing. dancing. Hisham Matar, David Van, thank you for your works. Thank you. And thank, thank you, you for totally being with us. Thank, thank you. Thank you. It's really nice to be yeah, with you. Yeah, thanks. That's good. Thanks. 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 Thanks.